Hello, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27, verses 1 through 56, that basically deal with the trials of Jesus before Pilate. Now, back in chapter 26, we discussed the illegality of the night trial. There are many things through here that in rabbinical Judaism itself were illegal. Let me give you a few of them. Number one, there could be no capital trial at night. Number two, you had to wait one day before you could execute the punishment of, of uh, a capital offense. So it had to be two days. Number three, there was no trial on a feast day. This was the first day of the feast. Number four, uh, there was, um, this was the time of the saying of the phylacteries, and yet they were busy uh, condemning him before Pilate. Number five, this was the time that they were to appear in the temple and offer their gifts, Exodus 23:15. So you see that this really came at a very odd time. It shows the, uh, the desperateness of the Jewish leaders to eliminate Jesus from the scene. Now, the Pharisees, because he was a blasphemer, and the Sadducees, because he was causing tension with Rome. Okay? Now, as soon as day broke, now, the night meaning is mentioned back in 2657. So we're talking about 6 a.m. in the morning is when these Roman governments had their, um, uh, their meetings. And so it's very early. And the reason I say that is there's been a lot of discussion about why this crowd, who just a few days earlier called him Hosanna, son of David, is now calling crucify him. Well, it's not the same crowd. Uh, I think maybe because of this um, regular procedure of releasing a prisoner that probably Barabbas' friends were there very early this special morning. It didn't take the high priest long to whip this crowd up, and this was not the same crowd of pilgrims that appears early in the triumphant entry. It was 6 a.m. in the morning. These uh, pilgrims were still sleeping after uh, being up late talking about the feast and visiting and all that. Now, so it's about 6 a.m., and the high priest, now the reason it's plural, there's only one high priest, but by this time it was a political plum that was purchased from the Romans. And so it's one Sadducean family, Annas, Caiaphas, and others of his sons are going to take the place. They were Sadducees. They are basically trying to keep the political status quo. They were the one who owned uh, the uh, uh, commercial terms for the temple and that's who Jesus overturned. That's why they were so mad at him. The elders, this high priest and elders, is a shortened form for the Sanhedrin, the ruling court of the Jews, okay? Held consultation against Jesus to put him to death. Now, we think they didn't have the power of death under Rome, and they had to go to Rome to get it, and that's what they wanted, so they decided to take him to Jesus and uh, take him to Pilate and accuse him of treason. So they bound him. Now, why bound him? It amazed me how many times Jesus is bound. He's bound in the gar a garden with so many soldiers. He's bound before uh, Annas. He's bound before Caiaphas. And now he's bound to go before Pilate. I just wonder if these Jews were afraid that Jesus was some kind of magician, that if he had his hands free, he could kind of zap them or something. I don't know, but it seems unusual that he's bound all the time. They led him away and turned him over to Pilate. This is Pontius Pilate. He was the procurator. Uh, of Judea from 26 to 36 A.D. Um, he was probably in the fortress Antonio. Now, some say he was in Herod's uh, castle or palace, but I really don't believe that because it's going to mention the Bema in verse 19 and the Praetorium in verse 27, and both of these would have been probably more in the fortress Antonio, which overlooked the temple because the Jews rioted so much. This was a feast day. Jerusalem had swelled to many times her normal, normal size. Pilate was there because it was a feast day. Many soldiers were there, and he was really watching out for any kind of riots or trouble. And that's the stage which the, the Jewish leaders took Jesus and accused him of treason. And boy, they planned it out real well. Now, notice what it mentions here then. Uh, then Judas, who had been betrayed by him, as he felt condemned in remorse. Now, my Williams translation and the Philip translation seems to imply that the, that the he felt condemned refers to Judas. But it really, I think, a little more literal of the Greek would be, he was condemned, which ceased to refer to Jesus. And all the other translations use it of Jesus. Now, the second word, remorse, here, by the way, this is aorist passive. The second word for remorse is a word that seems to mean sorrow after. Now, if I was speaking simply as a Greek um, uh, person who was conscious of the usage of the words, I would have to say, that the two words used in the Bible for true repentance and sorrow after shallow repentance are really synonymous, but they are used separately in the Bible. And I want to show you the two of them here. They're used in 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 10, both of them. 
The first one is metamelo, which seems to be true repentance, and then metamelami seems to be a false repentance or a sorry that you got caught kind of thing, not so much a true inner change. And so here it's the metamelami, which means Judas was sorry. There have been a lot of theories. Jesus tried to force Jesus' hand, and he was sorry when Jesus got caught. Uh, the Bible says he was a thief and afraid his time of pilfering was over. I don't know what Judas' motive was, but I know this. Peter committed the same kind of flagrant act of treason by denying he knew the Lord with an oath. Why is Peter the leader of the apostolic band and Judas a son of hell? Because of the attitude of their hearts about sin. Peter went to Jesus. Judas tried to make it up himself. Quite a difference. Now, notice here where it says, and brought back 30 pieces of silver. This is a prophecy from Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12. It is amazing how often the New Testament uses the little book Zechariah. Uh, half of the book is used in the Gospels, and the other half of the book is used in the Revelation. And you ought to read Zechariah. We've done it on tape. If you'd like a, a, a sample, send for it. Now, notice it mentions the 30 pieces of it to the high priest and elders and say, I did wrong in turning an innocent man over to, to death. But they said, what is this to us? They were supposed to be open for new evidence, but this was a... Uh, fixed trial from the beginning. They said, forget it. What's it to us? And so he tossed the money into the temple. And the word for temple here means the inner shrine, the holy of holies. Now, he's not supposed to be there. So maybe he stood at the gateway and threw that money as far as he could toward the holy place. Or maybe he went into the place where he shouldn't be. He was so upset and threw it down. I really don't know, but it seems to be holy of holies. Although, this same word is used in John 2.19 for the whole temple area, so we can't be dogmatic. Now, it says he went out and hanged himself. This is not a theological statement concerning suicide. It's totally not that. Now, the deal about he hung himself and then he burst open in Acts, some have seen discrepancy here, because here it, here it says the priest bought the field, and then it says Judas bought the field. Well, the idea is the money belonged to Judas, and so whoever bought it, it was considered Judas's field, and they used it for a burial place for Gentiles. Okay, notice this now. Um, the high priest picked the money up and said, it is not legal to put this consecrate or treasury for this is blood money. Now, isn't that the pits? They don't mind paying blood money, but they won't receive blood money? Now, that's just hard to believe, isn't it? That that could be what's happening here, that they are so concerned with it, uh, with it polluting their temple treasury when they're the ones that paid it out. Man. Now, uh, put into the consecrated treasury for its blood money. So after consultation, they bought with it the potter's field. Now, this potter's field is what's mentioned in Acts 1, 18 and 19. And it's, it's a place where probably the potters got the clay for their pots. That's what it is, okay? Notice where it mentions here then, um, excuse me, as a burying place for strangers, meaning Gentiles. Now, this piece of ground uh, has ever been since called the field of blood. Now, the tradition from the time of Jerome is it's in the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, or you might know it as Gehenna, okay? Uh, and it's one of the valleys right close to Jerusalem. There's some high hills where he hung himself and then fell, uh, fell down the cliff and burst open is the tradition. In that the words spoken by the prophet Jeremiah were fulfilled. Now, this has caused problems. You can't imagine how many problems this has caused. Because this is not a quote from Jeremiah directly. It's a quote from Zechariah. And so how has this caused such trouble? I mean, how can, it, how can the inspired author say Jeremiah when it's Zechariah? Well, there have been theories galore, I want you to know, and I want to give you a few of them and tell you which one I think is best. Uh, Augustine, Eusebius, um, Beza, Luther, Kyle say <laughs> Matthew just made a mistake. Um, Origen and Eusebius say copyist made a mistake. Jerome and Ewald say it's from apocryphal writing by Jeremiah that we don't have. Mead says Jeremiah wrote Zechariah 9 through 11. Uh, Lightfoot says that since in the Jerusalem canon the prophets are begun by Jeremiah, it's just a way of saying it's in the prophetic section. And then finally, uh, Hingstenberg says that Zechariah quoted Jeremiah. But the truth of the matter is that there are some places in Jeremiah that talk about Jeremiah buying a potter's field in this same geographical area. 
And so to fulfill all the details of the prophecy, you have to combine Jeremiah 18, 19, and 32, 7 through 9 with Zechariah 11, 12, and 13 to get the full prophecy. Now this very same thing is done in Mark 1, 2, and 3 where both Isaiah and Malachi are quoted together, but it says just says one of them. And so there we have a precedent. Now, uh, notice verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor at 6 a.m. in the morning, okay? And the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now this was the question of treason they were accusing him of. It was a very uh, rebellious time in that life of the nation of Israel. They were known for their rebellions over religious reasons. So Pilate was asking him, Are you claiming to be king of the Jews in a sense of bringing an uh, insurrection against Rome? And Jesus answers in a little kind of cryptic way. Mine says yes, but really it's, you say that I am. Well, I think we have to go to John 18, verses 33 to 37 to see what he's saying. He's saying to Pilate, I am the king of the Jews. I am the Messiah, but I'm not an earthly potentate. Uh, my kingdom is not of this world. So he's saying yes with a qualification. Seems to be the in, uh, enigmatic way he's saying this. Now, and while, the and, and while the charges were being brought against him by the high priests and elders, he made no answer. Now, he answered Pilate, but wouldn't answer the Jews. Why? Well, the Jews were afraid to go into the Roman uh, uh, headquarters because it would defile them for the Passover. So apparently they were outside, and Pilate took Jesus off for a private interview when he answered him so plainly. But when he got back in front of the Jews, he wouldn't say anything. Now, Notice where it says, he made no answer. This may be a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 7. And there's a lot of fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy here, particularly Isaiah 53 and Psalms 22. Uh, by the way, for this idea of the Jews not coming in to the praetorium, you might want to see John 18, 28, and 29. Okay? Then Pilate said to him, Do you hear how strong is the evidence they are bringing against you? Now the evidence is uh, spelled out in Luke 23, 2. They're accusing him of treason and not paying taxes and on and on. You can read Luke 23 too. Now at the feast, this is the Passover feast, the governor was accustomed. We learn from Josephus, Antiquity of the Jews. You might want to see 20 colon 9 colon 3. You need three uh, numerical designations to find your place in Josephus, okay? To set the prisoners free when the people wanted. At that time they had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. Now Bar means son and Abbas means father. Some say ba Rabbi, son of the rabbi or son of the father. Now, he, was, he is known as guilty of the very same crime in, Ma in Mark 15, 7. He was an insurrectionist. He was for sure guilty of the crime Jesus was only accused of. Now, so when they met for this purpose, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to set you free? Barabbas or Jesus, so called the Christ. Now, some later inferior manuscripts have Jesus Barabbas. But let me tell you what, it's not in Aleph, it's not in A, it's not in B, it's not in D, it's not in K, it's not in L. He was never called Jesus Barabbas. That was a later addition to kind of make the parallel more strong. His name is Barabbas. And, and, and I think anybody who says different hasn't looked at the manuscript evidence. It's overwhelming it shouldn't be in there and should have never been put in any text. Never, never, never. Now, the Christ means the Messiah. Christ is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew Messiah which is the word for the anointed one, which was the sign of being specially chosen and specially equipped by God for a task. Prophets, priests, and kings were anointed. That's where John Calvin got his uh, Christological outline, okay? Now, look at verse 18. For he knew they had turned him over to the court out of envy. Now, Pilate read through this deception. He recognized what they were doing, but he was in a period where there was a possible riot on his hands. He would have liked to have done just the opposite of what they wanted and tell you the truth. Pilate tries to relate Jesus all the way through here. He tries to give an option to the crowd. He tries to have him scourge. He tries to send him to Herod. He's trying to release him. But the, the, the crowd gets out of hand. And Pilate gets afraid and condescends to what they want. Now, now, verse 19 is really a parenthesis. Now, while he was on the bench, this is the place of judgment. Now, we'll see John 19, 13. His wife sent him word, Do not have anything to do with this righteous man, for I uh, have this morning suffered excruciating pain in a dream caused by him. Oh, well, now, what, where did we get this from? Who, who told this? 
third righteous man is a messianic title for Jesus. And how much she had come in contact with the, with the Christian church and had heard the gospel or she had heard de Jesus teach or whatever, we don't know. But isn't this interesting? Now, I'm pretty sure that, that uh, I don't know if she's a full-blown believer here or not, but the superstition of Pilate must have run all over him with his wife sending him a word like this. Thanks a lot, hon. <laughs> See you when I get home tonight was, this, was the view. So, but it's so interesting. A little, a little, a little uh, parenthesis like this is, just looks like a, such a common thing in life. And yet we wonder if she really trusted the Lord, knew him, and if Jesus revealed himself to her. Huh, we just don't know. Verse 20, but the high priests and the elders lined up the crowd to ask for Barabbas. I really think the crowd was already there for Barabbas. It didn't take them much to whip him up, to have Jesus put to death. Uh, still the governor answered, which of the two do you want me to set free to you? He asked a second time. We want Barabbas, and Pilate asked. Then what do I do with Jesus, uh, the so-called Christ, Messiah? That's what they say. Have him crucified. My goodness. Jewish people wanting a, a Jewish rabbi crucified? What's the deal? Well, why? why? What has he done uh, that is wrong? And they kept on shouting, imperfect tense, over and over, louder and louder, have him crucified. So Pilate, when he saw the crowd, was making no headway with him, and that a riot was about to break out. Instead, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd. Now, this washing of the hands, this is not a Roman legal procedure. This is a Jewish legal procedure really a Jewish ritual procedure for the priest. You might want to see Deuteronomy 21, 6, Psalms 73, 13, and Psalms 26, 6. Pilate's doing what they understood to get the guilt off him and on them. I am not responsible for this man's death. You must see to it yourselves. And look what they say. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. I get goosebumps over that. You might want to see Acts 5, 28 for an amplification. Now, the children here are used in two sense. One, in the Old Testament, children somehow were a man's immortality. And number two, there's, a, there's the idea of corporate, what the father does, affects the children. And you might want to see Exodus 20, uh, 5 and 6 for that. They're bringing a terrible curse on themselves. A terrible curse on themselves. Then he set Barabbas free for them, and he had Jesus flogged. Now, flogged. The Romans scourged, which is flogging. The Jews beat with rods. And the rods you hit 39 times, a third on the front, two thirds on the back. But there was no set number to flogging, though 40 was the, the typical number. If I can describe it to you, and though when I do, I, I want you to realize the Bible does not spend a lot of time describing the physical pain of Jesus. Now the medieval church did, but the Bible doesn't. The real thing is not the physical brutality, but the spiritual significance. But I want to describe it to you anyway. They would take a man's clothes off. They would bend him over and tie his hands to a low stake. They would take a whip with a wooden handle, maybe leather thongs two and a half feet long, tie rocks and bones and pieces of metal in the end of these nine cattail strips. And when they hit, it, the things would wrap around and begin to tear. It is quite often you could see a man's intestines after the beating. The beating killed most people. Now we learn from other passages of scripture that Pilate had him beat before he was condemned. I think again to win sympathy of the crowd and try to get him released with just a beating, but it didn't work. Everybody who was crucified under Rome was beaten like this. It, it, it made death quicker. It was a very painful experience. And of course crucifixion was as gross and as painful as it could be to deter crime. That's what it was for. Now, um, okay, and turned over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the barracks, the praetorium. Now, it's interesting to me that Matthew leaves out um, the account of before Herod in Luke 23, 6 and following, and pri the private interview with Pilate, John 18, 28 through 32, okay? And they gathered around him, they, put, they, they stripped him and put a purple cloak on him. Now, the literal Greek here is scarlet. But now the ancients were not as technical on their colors. It could be a light blue to a dark purple, okay? The other gospels have purple, but Matthew has scarlet. It's from the, the name of the insect that was used to get the dark red dye. You might want to see John 19.2 and Mark 15.17. It was probably a faded Roman officer's scarlet robe that looked purple, and purple was the color of royalty to play on Jesus claiming to be a king. That's the idea here. Now, the crown of thorns in verse 29, I have always thought it was thorns that stuck into his brow. But looking at the history, it may have been a play 
on a, the radiant crown of the emperor. So it may have been a palm leaf. It may not have been so much to stick the thorns in his face, though that may have happened, but to play like it was this radiant crown of the Roman emperors. And that fits the historical background uh, quite well. Uh, notice it says they spit on him. The soldiers hated the Jews. The, jo the Jews thought they were unclean, wouldn't fellowship with them, wouldn't do anything. And they kind of took their animosity out on Jesus. That's obvious. Now in verse 32, And they were going out of the city. They found a Cyrenian named Simon. Now his name is Jewish. And we learn from Acts 6, 9, there was a synagogue of the Cyrenians. Now this means Libya in northern Africa. But I really believe it is a white Jew from a black African country. Not a black as we usually see. Now, notice it says, they forced him to carry his cross. Now, they forced him is a Persian word used of Persian mail carriers to force private citizens into their aid. And here it's using Matthew 5.41 for going the second mile, the concept. Now, to carry the cross member, not the whole cross, but the cross member, we're not sure if the cross was a capital T, a little t, or an X. Some try to go down where it says they nailed this uh, title over the cross in verse 37 to say it's a, a small t, but we're just not sure. All three forms uh, have been found. Uh, when they came to a place called Golgotha, now that's Aramaic, uh, okay, and the place of the skull, uh, that's Calvary, the ideal of Latin. Now it doesn't mean a place of skulls. That only developed out of the Tyndale translation. The Jews would not allow unburied people in, close to the holy city. It means a low, round hill, like the front of a skull, or the top of a skull, not the place of skulls, okay? And they tried to give him some wine mixed with gall. This is a prophecy of uh, Psalm 69, 21. Some of the wealthy ladies of Jerusalem, it was, a, it was a, a drug to deaden the pain. When Jesus tasted what he, what he had, he wouldn't, wouldn't take it. He is going to take the vinegar over here in verse uh, 48, because I think he wanted to speak and his tongue was dry, and so he took the, the wine, cheap vinegar the soldiers had, but not this drug here. And they crucified him, Psalms 22:16, but not a real physical description uh, at all. They don't go into that. Then divided among them the, the, uh, his clothes by lot, Psalms 22:18, and possibly the idea that he was crucified naked may be true, though they may have left just the loincloth on him, or they may have just had him naked. Uh, this was common, dividing by lots, some, some kind of scrabble or dice throwing. Um, they put above his head the charge, King, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Now we learned from John 19, 19 through 22, it's in three languages, uh, Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. We also learned from tradition that the soldier would carry this sign before Jesus through the streets of Jerusalem. Pilate did this to make the Jews mad. didn't say he claimed to be, it said he is King of the Jews. It was kind of Pilate's way of getting him back, you know, because they were mad. He was kind of his gigging them in the side, you see. Now, notice it says, um, same time two robbers were crucified with him. Now we'll see Isaiah 53, 12. It's fulfilled prophecy all the way through here. And the passerbyers kept hissing and shaking their heads. Now it was done on a major roadway because it was a turret to crime. Now, uh, Psalms 22, 7 uh, is a fulfillment of that. I don't think the modern Golgotha is what we're talking about. The, the Mohammedans tried to destroy all the sites to keep the pilgrims from coming, and we have no idea, no idea where it is. Gardens Calvary is just because of the shape of the skull, but I think it's the wrong skull. <laughs> um, and then verse 40, if you are really God's son, this is exactly what the devil said in Matthew 4, 3. It's kind of the same, aha, it's, it's a condition, okay? If you are the son of God, uh, come down from the cross. And the high priest too made sport of him. They were playing, show us this fancy sign. Do something miraculous and we'll believe in you. That's what they're, that's what they're saying. Uh, he put his trust in God, verse 43. Let God deliver him. That's a quote from Psalms 22, 8. Uh, if he cares for him, for he said, I'm the son of God. The Jews had no doubt that Jesus claimed to be God, the Messiah. And that's what they're throwing in his teeth right here. Uh, even the robbers... Uh, you know, made play of that. You might want to see Luke 23, 39 to 43, where one of them returns in faith to him. It was 12 o'clock noon, okay, and the darkness fell from 12 till 3. You might want to see Amos 8, 9, or Exodus 10, 21 and following. The darkness was God's way of turning his face away from his son. It was the last sinful experience of man, total separation from God that I think Jesus feared. Uh, it's why, and, and my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? That's a direct quote from the beginning of Psalms 22. And I think as Jesus bore the sin of all the earth that God turned his face away. And that was the horror of being separated from God. That's why Jesus knows how we feel now as lost people. 
because he's even been there. He's even knows what that like. Now I'll put 2 Corinthians 5, 21 there. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, that's Aramaic, for my God, my God. They thought he was saying Eloi, Eloi being Elijah, and the words sound very much alike. He is calling for Elijah, which is Malachi 4, 5, which is supposed to precede the Messiah. And they said, wait and see if he comes. Don't give him something to drink. I think the drink is related to John 19, 30, where he needed to speak one more thing, and he couldn't. His mouth was so dry, so he took that. Psalms 22, 15. The curtain of the sanctuary is broke from top to bottom. At Psalms uh, 31, 5, you might well see Luke 23, 46, where that's also mentioned. The idea here is that from, from God's top, not from man, from the top. And it, we think it's the curtain into the holy place, or the holy of holies, either one. Rabbinical tradition in the Talmud says that at that moment an earthquake hit, and the doors of the temple opened by themselves. The earthquake is mentioned down in verse 54. And it, so it's a divine way of showing, we think, as Christians, that the way to God was fully opened by the death of Christ. Now, the captain of the guard in verse 54 says, Surely this was God's son. Now, in Luke uh, 23, 47, there is no article. He's not converting here. He's just making a statement. This guy died unusually. This is really someone special. This is not a confessional formula saying, He is the Messiah and I trust him. No, it, there's, there's not any of that at all. The women were standing there. They, they accompanied Jesus, ministered to him, I think both physically and monetarily. It lists them here in 56. But the same list in Mark 15:40 is a little different. We get their, the other names or who, who it refers to by, by two designations here. Mary Magdala in Mark 16:9 had the demons cast out of her. Mary, the mother of James the Less and Joseph. Then the mother of Zeb Zebedee would be uh, James and John, and that's who we have here. This, this is an account, not so much physical, but of the spiritual consequences of the rebellion of the high priest and the fulfilled prophecy of Jesus Christ which brought our ultimate redemption through his blood. I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again same time, same place next week.